We're going to be in Exodus chapter 9. It's page 60 in the Pew Bible at the very bottom of the page. This is our 13th week in the book of Exodus, and the title of our message today is One True God, Believe and Obey. Believe and Obey. And we're going to pick up with verse 12. And we're going to start, and you will see where we end with this same idea, the same aspect of what God was doing in Egypt through the plagues. And just to kind of warn you ahead of time, this is a pretty clear and somber warning for us. It's something we really need to get deep into our minds. And so that's what we're going to pray the Lord would make clear to us this morning. Look at verse 12 of chapter 9 in Exodus. But Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And he, Pharaoh, did not listen to them as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. This is the concluding line of the last plague that we had just looked at. After six powerful acts of God, there is still the same result happening in Pharaoh. And we need to understand that what is happening here is exactly what God said would happen. God was bringing everything to pass just as he said. If you read the story of Exodus, you see these ten plagues occurring. The question becomes, why in the world Did God not change his heart after one plague? I mean, he's powerful enough to do all these amazing things that we see him do. Surely he could have brought Pharaoh to his knees in one moment. The answer to that question is God had a plan that he was unfolding throughout all ten of the plagues. And God intended from the very beginning to work all ten of these plagues to demonstrate everything that they demonstrated. In fact, we see this phrase at the very end of this, as Yahweh had spoken to Moses Repeated over and over again. Almost every time Pharaoh's hard-heartedness is mentioned. When the miracle of the staff happened in chapter 7, verse 13, the same phrase. When the, blood, uh, the water turned to blood in the Nile in 7.22, same phrase. The frogs that came in 8.15, same phrase. The gnats in 8.19, same phrase. Boils in 9.12, same phrase. And you'll see this same phrase repeated in the next three plagues as well. All of this takes us back, if you're thinking of the whole story, and this is a story that's unfolding that we've looked at for several weeks, we know that back at the burning bush, before God sent Moses back to Egypt, he told him, this was the plan, Moses. It will be long, it will take time, I'm going to do a number of great and mighty things. Could I make Pharaoh comply the moment you step foot in Egypt? Yes, but I have a deeper purpose, Moses. So in Exodus chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, God told Moses, from the beginning, I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. And then right when Moses gets back to Egypt, he's, he's come back from the burning bush in the wilderness of Midian. In Exodus chapter 4, 21, Yahweh said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, and he will not let the people go. We have to understand, all of this is taking place in Exodus, not just because it's foreseen by God, but because he is working out his perfect plan to display the grandeur of his power. God is in control of all things in every single moment. We've talked about this so many times, but we must come back and work this thought over and over and over again in our minds all throughout this series because honestly, how deeply you believe this truth will impact how you respond to things that surprise or shock or confuse or scare us in this life. So I've been reflecting on this a lot the last couple of weeks because I've been reflecting a lot on things that have taken place over the last few years. A lot of good things have happened and a lot of bad things have happened both locally as well as nationally and globally. We've been through a lot in the last couple years. And I've been thinking about all of those things, and as I think about those things, I reflect on how God has built me and wired me uniquely and how that has led to the responses I've had to these things we've been through. Many of you might know, some of you might not, but my sport when I was younger uh, was chess. Yes, it is a sport. The International Olympic Oversight Committee on their website in official publications list it as a recognized sport, so do not hate on it, all right? Anyway, it's not the point. I spent a number of years playing chess competitively, and that is also a thing. I played tournaments all around the United States, even went to Russia as part of a U.S. team to play against the Russian uh, team. One of the necessities to playing chess well, as you might imagine, is the ability to think ahead. 
It's to run possible scenarios, to analyze situations, and come up with various potentials on how you'll respond, and to do all of that before things happen, and then to be able to analyze and adapt when something surprising happens that you didn't foresee coming. I think playing so much chess when I was younger really helped shape uh, me into the person that I am today. My analysis is really just second nature to me. Most of the time, I don't have to think, okay, now I've got to sit down and analyze. Something happens, and I immediately begin analyzing. I immediately begin thinking of potentials. I immediately work through scenarios in my mind. That's just default, part of who I am. But the reality of life, really like the reality in chess, is that I cannot foresee everything, no matter how much I analyze, no matter how much of a second nature that is to me. I just don't know for sure what will happen in the future. I can foresee some things in life correctly, and I can understand them, but in the grand scheme of things, my, my perspective, my view is quite limited because I'm finite. I'm mortal. No amount of forethought could pre ever prevent me from having surprises or coming to situations that are shocking in life. Chess can help me maybe respond to those a little faster because I can analyze quickly, but really the main difference in how I respond doesn't come from my background playing chess. It comes from my faith. And the most important part of my faith in guiding how I respond is how deeply I believe truths about God like this one. What I believe about God being not just really good at forethought, not just a God who's really good at seeing scenarios and planning out possibilities. What I believe about God is that he is actually in control of everything in every single moment. That shapes how I respond when I missed it, when my analysis was wrong, when something surprises or shocks me. I rely on the fact that God wasn't surprised. He's never running scenarios. He's never coming up with a new plan. He's never trying to figure out, why did this happen? No, he knows. He's sovereign. He's in control of everything at every given moment. Now, in these three plagues that we're going to look at at Exodus today, God is going to continue to display the truth of this, how he controls everything to accomplish his specific purposes. And because of that, he then is the only one who is to be believed and obeyed. But this continued response of Pharaoh in rebellion, this ever-deepening hardness of heart that we see noted in him, and the continuation of powerful plagues of judgment against Israel is because God is using Pharaoh to teach us a crucial lesson, and it's this. God alone is to be fully believed and completely obeyed. Anything less than that is sinfully insufficient and dangerously deserving of deadly punishment. Hardness of heart, any hardness of heart that you and I would want to try and maintain or deepen in will have devastating consequences because God takes sin seriously. So recall, from the last two weeks, as we started to look at the plagues, they began on the water, they moved into the land, and now here the power of God will come from the sky at the start of the seventh plague. Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 to 19. Then Yahweh said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and your servants and your people so that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as has never been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter for every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Now in this section here where he's laying out what's coming next for Pharaoh, this judgment that's on the way, we can see two connected purposes are laid out by God. The first is God's uniqueness is going to be displayed. Right? His unique power, his unique control, how different he is from the false gods, the idols of Egypt that they have been worshiping. God wants us, all of us, all of humanity to understand he is the one true God alone. There is no one like him. He has no rivals. There's no competitors. There's nobody who's his equal or his peer. He is utterly unique. The theological term that we've talked about is God is completely holy. Set apart. There's nobody like him. 
It doesn't matter where we go in this world. It doesn't matter what people group we interact with. It doesn't matter what mythologies they have built out, what idols they worship, or how sincerely they hold their beliefs. God says plainly, there is no one like our God anywhere at any time. He is the only true God. And what that means, since he is who he says he is, since he's the only one worthy of worship, the only one who has this kind of power, what that means is God is worthy of praise from all people. Not just the Hebrews. Not just the chosen family of Abraham. He's worthy of worship from every person upon the earth. Look at verse 16 there. He says, it is for this purpose, Pharaoh, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Not just here, not just among my people, not just among this little group. All the earth will know who I am. That's the point, Pharaoh. That's what God deserves, is everyone to know who he is. Everyone to understand what God has done, what, who he is demands of us as the one true God. This is our mission. This is why we exist upon this earth, is to fulfill this command, to proclaim this to those around us. Believing that's what's going to lead Randy and Carolyn to get on a plane and head to Guatemala Tuesday morning. It's not just the joy of traveling in this post-COVID time, right? Where now we have vaccines and tests and masks and re restrictions on group sizes and limitations and threats of if you get it, we're going to quarantine you. Who knows where at your own expense, right? That, that's not fun. <laughs> That's not what would lead them to go to Guatemala this coming week. What will lead them to go there is because they understand their primary purpose in life is to proclaim God to those in all the nations. And God's given them a unique opportunity, this connection they have with these pastors and these churches to go there and support them and equip them and enable them to proclaim the gospel to their people in Guatemala day by day while we spend our lives up here proclaiming the gospel to the people around us day by day. That's the purpose. That's why they will go. That's why year to date we've invested $15,400 in work in Guatemala. Because we believe all peoples should hear and know who God is. That's why we have a designated fund set up. It's available on our online giving. It's available if you write in the memo of your check, Guatemala Missions, that money will go into a specific intentional fund to go to the work in Guatemala. That way, people can continue to hear about God there. $8,370 of that $15,400 came from people designating a gift to Guatemala for this work to continue. We believe this is important. And the importance of the mission is not just limited to Guatemala, though we invest significantly there. That $15,000 is only a part of the $43,000 we've invested year to date in missions worldwide. We really believe this is true. God's uniqueness is displayed, and he is worthy of worship from all peoples everywhere. And we want to be a part of making that happen, seeing the message proclaimed. So we invest. We put money into people and projects and ministries outside of this local church so that all may hear who he is, what he's done, and what that means for their lives. So naturally, if these things are true, if these points are true, then with that purpose in mind, we see here there's a, the first invitation extended to the Egyptian people to repent themselves, to believe and trust in Yahweh and to be saved. Look at verses 20 and 21. He says, Then whoever feared the word of Yahweh among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of Yahweh left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Here the people have a chance. Those who heard the proclamation, this plague is coming, they were given a chance to find salvation by obeying the word of the Lord. And some did, and others did not. Notice specifically, it is the word of God that demands response here. It's not the authority of Moses. It's that Yahweh was speaking here. God's words, whenever he speaks them, always have the uttermost weight upon humanity. The application for you and I, because this applies to us, not just to them in Exodus, the, the lesson for you and I to learn right here is that salvation always comes in response to God's word. Right. Salvation only comes from response to God's word with belief and obedience. That's why we gather in here to hear him speak through the preaching of the scripture week by week. 
These moments do matter. They do impact eternity when we hear God speak to us and we respond with belief and obedience. I mean, that's why, like, in this message, I, I briefly mentioned my, my past with, with chess as an illustration, right? But today's not about chess. I'm not giving you a lesson on the Vienna Gambit. I'm not setting up boards at the front and inviting you to come and play me in this gathering. We didn't gather for today for chess. We gathered to hear the word of God from the scriptures. That's the central point. So that you and I could hear God speak and then move in belief and obedience of him and be saved. That's the goal. The Egyptians here who had faith and who obeyed the word of Yahweh, they were saved from the plague that came. Look at 23 to 26. So Moses stretched out his staff towards heaven, and Yahweh sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And Yahweh rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail. Such has never been in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. And what an incredible incredible testimony of God's power and the precision of his power, right? He controls everything to accomplish his specific purposes, which means he sends this incredibly devastating storm upon Egypt, and yet not a single piece of hail falls upon Goshen, which, remember, is right there in the land of Egypt. (laughs) It's not like, well, it's across the ocean on the other side, you know, and so the storm fizzles out before it gets there. No, they're there. Egypt's here. The storm hits all around them, and nothing falls upon God's people. Believing God to have that kind of power, believing God does this type of stuff, really does practically and personally impact us. It can calm fears today if you really believe this. I, I know that's true. Because a week and a half ago, that Thursday night, you remember that Thursday night when all those storms were rolling through? I had just gotten to sleep. I'm, I'm guessing I must have just gotten into a pretty deep sleep. I, I didn't go to bed much before this, but at 11.45, I woke up rather aggressively to Malia having grabbed my face and shaking me hard to get up because her phone was going off that we had a tornado warning, you and area take cover. So we get out of bed, right? We get the kids out of bed. We go downstairs. They're kind of cuddling up, and, and we're going to monitor and, and see how this is. And I go to look and see what does it look like outside. And I'm looking. It's, it looks like a powerful storm, right? If any of you saw it, it was power. Lots of lightning, lots of thunder. There was a lot of rain coming down. But over and over and over again, in my mind, in my heart, as I stood there and watched all of this, was God controls every bit of this storm. So the words of Job in chapter 38, 35 came to mind where Job, God is speaking to Job and and tells him, hey, I'm the one who sends forth the lightning and I guide down where it strikes. I'm the one, he says in verse 25, who clefts channels for the rain to land exactly where I want it to go. I'm the one who causes thunderbolts to ring out because of my command. And here in Exodus chapter 9, I thought God sent a powerful storm of thunder, hail, lightning, and fire that was raining down upon Egypt, but not Goshen. They were protected. There in the midst of it all, God's people had protection because he chose to save them. And I just reminded myself of this truth. God's in control of this storm as much as he was that one. And Lord, you're good. Whatever happens is within your will. I trust you. I asked him to protect my family, to keep us safe, and I believed And I didn't have fear. This stuff matters practically. And this belief should impact not just how you view storms. It should be how you view everything in life. No matter the situation, if you believe this to be true, if you believe this is who God is, it really will impact how you live. If you know he's the God of great power, the one who judges, who commands, who destroys idols, and he is the God of gracious salvation and protection for his people who particularly loves and cares and knows everything about us and where we are, it will change how you live. The hailstorm in Exodus is a warning that you and I must pay careful attention to God's word because there are only two ways to respond to God's word. One is to believe and obey his word and the other is to ignore him and pay the price. That's what we see take place in Exodus. That's what takes place here every single week. 
You have the choice to make. How will you respond to the word of God? Are you going to listen and are you going to believe and are you going to obey him? Or are you going to sit here because that's what we do and you're going to let it roll in one ear and out the other and your heart become hardened and you ignore God? There's only two choices. There's only two responses. Look at verses 27 to 30. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. Yahweh is in the right, I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with Yahweh, for there's been enough of God's thunder and hail, and I will let you go. You shall stay no longer. But Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out from the city, I will stretch out my hands to Yahweh. The thunder will cease, there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear Yahweh our God. Moses says that because Moses understands this truth. What we see in Pharaoh here is not repentance. It's remorse. See, remorse is the sadness that comes from suffering God's judgment. Remorse is the regret that our choices, our sins, do have consequences. Remorse is wanting our suffering, our hardships, to end and trying to do something to bring that end about. Remorse is really useful when it helps persuade sinners to repent. But remorse in and of itself is not enough. A lot of people are filled with remorse for what happens when their sin is exposed, when consequences come, but they don't truly repent of their sins. So many people today around us, this is true, inside the church and outside the church. It's true of Pharaoh here. I mean, look at what he says. He says, this time I have sinned. Which sounds right, but it isn't, because he's not really gotten to the understanding what sin truly is, right? Pharaoh doesn't say, I've been sinning since day one against Yahweh. I have lived a life of idolatry and rebellion against the one true God. I, I am a wretched, wretched sinner who needs deliverance from the God who can save his own people. I need to repent of all of my sins and lay them down. No, he just has remorse that now his people are dying as hail falls from the sky. The only way for us to really tell if a person is really repentant or just remorseful is to see what happens after they confess their sins and seek to end the consequences. Because true repentance is a complete change of heart that produces a change of life. True repentance is a complete change of heart that produces a change of life. Remorse alone doesn't produce a changed heart and a changed life. That's true for Pharaoh, and it's true today, too. So don't think you can fool God by expressing remorse, or that you can fool God's people who are walking in the light with him. You must repent, and that means your heart and your life must actually be changed if you repent. But Pharaoh doesn't. Verses 33 to 35. Moses went out from the city, away from Pharaoh, stretched out his hands to Yahweh, and the thunder and hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as Yahweh had spoken through Moses. God's not done working here. Look at chapter 10. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know I am Yahweh. So God gives another piece of the explanation here. Why does it take 10 plagues? Why does God work over this prolonged period of time in this way with all these demonstrations? He tells us here part of the reason for God pouring out his judgment on his enemies in this way is so that his people and their children and their grandchildren will know who he is. So we have concern for missions globally for all people to know. But we also have concern that all generations would know. And the generations that we particularly look to impact are not just the ones around the world, they're the ones that are here. That who will be here, Lord willing, until Jesus Christ returns, probably far beyond our own lifetimes. We care that the message and the name of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed to our children and our grandchildren and their children and their children, generation upon generation. 
It's why we celebrate when we have moments like we celebrated this morning, when Callie comes to faith a week and a half ago, when Julia a month ago has the Lord working in their hearts to draw them into a saving trust, a desire to obey God and his word. We celebrate that. Why? Because the next generation is hearing and understanding who God is. And that's why we're here. That's why we gather. That's why we do Sunday school. That's why we have worship services. Why we have kids' church. It's why we have fellowship times. Because we want this truth to pass on. And God tells us all this action he undertook in Egypt, his hardening of Pharaoh's heart over and over and over again, his display of incredible power in all the different plagues that he pours out was so we would know who he is and what he can do, and we would live in light of that passing on knowledge of God to the next generation and the one after that and the one after that. Look at verses three to six. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. They shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of your servants and all the Egyptians so neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have ever seen from this day, from the day they came on the earth to this day. Then they turned and went out from Pharaoh. I'm betting many of you have read the series of books written by Laura Ingalls Wilder about her time growing up on the prairie. We're reading uh, that series with the kids at night, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's engaging. Julia likes the story of Laura. She wasn't as keen when we talked about Almanzo. She didn't care about the little boy. She just wanted to know about Laura. But we've read that story, and one of the books we read back in uh, March, early April time was the book On the Shores of Plum Creek. And in that book, if you remember it, Laura recounts a specifically, particularly devastating year. The year was actually 1875 when uh, what she calls grasshoppers, but were actually a, a, a variety of locusts, tore through the plains of the Midwest, including Minnesota, where her pa had planted all his crops and was hoping to finally get this, this big financial boon, and they destroyed everything in the area. As I read that story and Laura's descriptions of all the things that happened, the kids were really drawn in. They were wondering, could something like that really happen? Is this true? They were imagining, they were feeling the descriptions of Laura's grasshoppers. They were literally everywhere, crawling over everything. It's a really terrifying account, if it's true, of what happened and how powerful these insects can be. And it is true. This really did happen. You can go look at the research about the time frame and where the Ingalls were, and this really did take place for three years. These, ke these locusts kept coming and destroying crops all throughout the region. And it wasn't just a problem on the prairie or an ancient event that took place in Egypt. If you remember back in 2019 and 20, that was before COVID, <laughs> became the only thing the news ever talked about. If you remember back to then, there was plagues of locusts swarming all over Africa and the Middle East, destroying crops all over the place. I mean, famine was a real threat in many locations because locusts were coming and just destroying everything. That's in our modern age, right? With all our technology, with all our advancement. In fact, there's actually, I found, there's apps. You can track locust swarms on your phone now because they know where they are, but we can't stop them. You can just get on here and go, are they coming? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I think this is a real thing. It's a real problem. The destruction these insects can cause is massive, even in a short amount of time. And all the way back here in Exodus, what we know is this really did take place. God sent these things directly upon Egypt. Look at 1014. The locusts came over all the land of Egypt, settled on the whole country of Egypt, such a dense swarm of locusts has never been seen before, nor ever will be again. Now, that's an incredible statement, because if you go read what Laura said in 1875, or you look at photos from 2019 or 2020, and you see all of these locusts there. I mean, we're talking millions. Scientists think maybe billions or trillions of locusts in some of these massive swarms that can stretch hundreds of miles wide. This massive storm was nothing compared to what God did in Egypt. I mean, isn't that incredible? And not only did God send that there upon Egypt and watch and begin to draw everything, but in Goshen, none. 
Again, he spares his people. The text is clear. This impacted Egypt. Over and over, it stresses, in Egypt, all of this happened. But God has been protecting his people from the consequences of these plagues, as we saw last week. The flies or mosquitoes didn't touch God's people. The plague upon the livestock didn't kill their livestock. The plague of boils didn't land upon the Israelites. The plague of the hailstorm didn't land in Goshen. God demonstrates incredible power and precision in these plagues. But again, Pharaoh demonstrates only remorse for the consequences. And he tries to barter a compromise with Moses and his God. He doesn't repent. He doesn't believe in the true God and obey the one true God. Look at verses 16 and 17. Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Look at 17. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once, and plead with Yahweh your God only to remove this death from me. I mean, this is remorse, not repentance in Pharaoh. He just wants the suffering, the consequences to end. He doesn't truly believe in and submit to the one true God. I mean, listen to how arrogant he is here. He admits only partially his sins, right? And asks for forgiveness only this once. I mean, it couldn't be more clear. He's motivated by just wanting the consequences to cease, not to follow the one true God. He's not humbling himself, admitting his lifetime of idolatry, his repeated rebellion, his twisted sinful heart. He simply wants people to stop dying because it's a terrible, terrible plague. And God answers the prayer when Moses prays and begins to prepare the next plague for Pharaoh. Yahweh turned the wind into a very strong west wind, lifted all the locusts, drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh did not let the people of Israel go. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But the people of Israel had light where they lived. Again, what an incredibly powerful judgment God pours out upon Egypt. I mean, he's totally destroying the supposed power of the Egyptian gods who worshipped the sun and had many gods attached to the sun and its different functions. The most primary among them was Amun-Ra, who was the one who was to control the sunrise. Every day was supposed to be a testimony to the power of Ra, of Amun-Ra, that he could cause the sun to rise and bring life and everything could be sustained. And God says for three days, he's nothing. He doesn't exist. You want to know who causes the sun to rise? Me. You want to know who can bring darkness? Me, Yahweh, the one true God. And this darkness that God sends here physically is a symbol of the darkness of God's enemies. See, every person who is apart from God is in darkness. They're utterly without hope. They are blind. They are just grasping at things in this life, never truly experiencing the full beauty and purpose until the light of God illuminates someone's heart and mind. In 24 to 26, Pharaoh again called Moses and said, Go, serve Yahweh. Your little ones may also go with you, but let your flocks and herds remain behind. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings so that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take them to serve Yahweh our God, and we do not know with what we must serve Yahweh until we arrive there. Now understand, Moses is not being coy here in his reply. This is not a negotiation tactic to just ensure they don't leave any of these really valuable livestock behind. He's actually hitting on a truth that makes unbelievers and probably even some believers really, really uncomfortable. Obedience and true worship of God actually demands everything of us. I mean, it may literally cost us everything we have. To give up every bit of money that we possess, all of our resources, every moment of our time, our very lives may need to be laid down in order to obey and truly worship God. But he's worthy of that. We can give everything that we have and still he would deserve more. He is so worthy. So the question is, are you prepared to truly worship God as he deserves? Or are you just playing at this when it's easy or convenient. Like the Egyptians, modern Westerners, us Americans, we have many idols 
that we can worship and spend our lives on instead of God. And the greatest idol that we seem to have seems to be ourselves. We honor and admire and love ourselves more than anyone or anything else. We live for ourselves more often than we will live for God. Being one of God's people is a great, great gift. It means we are richly blessed. It means we are treated with God's undeserved kindness and mercy. It means in the end we will be saved from all the folly and foolishness of our sin. But don't think for a second that grace is free means that grace is not a costly thing. Because our salvation cost Christ, sacrificing his life in our place. That was the cost. To redeem his own people, to bring salvation to us, meant that God the Son would leave his throne in heaven. He would take on flesh. He would live in this broken world among people who are ruled and controlled by their sin. And he would suffer here on this earth all the way up to the cross where he would sacrifice himself to pay the price for our sins, to offer salvation to you and I. It took the death of the Son of God in our place for us to have grace. Christianity is costly. Grace is a free gift to us, but it is not a cheap thing. This quote should be so striking to the Christian heart from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who was killed by Nazis at the end of the war. He writes, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus living and incarnate. Cheap grace, my friends, is not grace at all. No, true grace, he continues to write, is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. It is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. You were bought with a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. So understand today, being a Christian may cost us everything. It may cost us all our earthly pleasures, all our resources. I guarantee you, though, no matter what he takes in that regard, what it will certainly cost you if you follow him is it will cost you your idols. It will cost you your special sins. It will cost you your pride and your self-worship because Jesus died to destroy those things. And what cost him so much, he will not let enter his kingdom. He will destroy our idols and he will root out our sins if we belong to him. What he paid a high price for, he will not treat lightly. It is the hardness of our hearts, the hardness of our sinful nature that pushes back against this truth and wants instead for us to go cower in the darkness with our special sins rather than embrace the light of God. And in verse 27, we find that's exactly what Pharaoh does. Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. We end where we began this morning. The same phrase, the same serious, somber warning to us. A hard heart and continued sinful rebellion is dangerous and is deadly. We are warned here by the intentional plan of God in unfolding with the life of Pharaoh that you and I could hear this warning from the text of Scripture today. Do not leave this place with any hardness in your heart today. It will cost greatly. And if you're his child, understand he died to remove all this from you. When Charles Spurgeon, my favorite pastor, preached from Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, that said, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourselves before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. This is what Spurgeon said to his church that day. Forget Pharaoh and only think of yourself now. Let the Lord Jesus Christ himself with the thorn-crowned head and the pierced hand stand by your pew and looking right down into your soul, say in his matchless tone, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? 
That's the question he's asking each of us today. When will you humble yourself before God? Will it be today? When today there's mercy and grace and forgiveness to be offered and experienced? Or will it be on the day after his power and his judgment and his wrath come to destroy and condemn your idolatry and rebellion and hard-heartedness? Worship team, if you'll come and prepare to lead us in our final song and our final moments of response. Understand this morning that God is worthy of all worship. From us and from all peoples upon the earth at all times in history, he is the one who must be believed and must be obeyed in everything. And God is in total control of every moment, including this one here, that he is giving you as an opportunity to respond and answer this question. How long will you refuse to lay down every idol, every sin, every self-centered piece of pride? How long will it take for you to lay those things down? Will you do it today in this moment of mercy and grace? Or will you wait until he exposes those things? He brings judgment and consequence against those things. Right now, this moment is a moment to respond and find grace and mercy. John tells us all throughout his gospel that Jesus Christ came as the true light. The darkness that plagued Egypt is nothing compared to the darkness that holds the sinner captive, but Jesus came to break through the darkness. And these moments are for us now to come to the light, to repent and to respond and to trust in him, to believe his word, to obey him. The altars are open. I'd love to pray with you if you would like to pray today. But let's take these moments to respond and answer this question in our own hearts. Let's humble ourselves before the one true God today.